Hey there and welcome to the first series of lectures for astronomy and cosmology. So I hope you guys had fun watching the demo, uh, the Stellarium demo from the last video. So now in this uh, session we'll be looking at some of the more exam oriented concepts and we'll be answering most of the questions that we raised in the last video. So if I were to just write those down, so some of those questions were how do you or how do we because I guess we are friends now how do we estimate interstellar distances how do we estimate the radii of planets or stars And how do we estimate the brightness of some of these stars? So we looked at the demo last time. So that was not only just a so that was not only just an estimate of the distances. If you looked carefully, then that uh, app was also showing how the distances are changing with time. So that was uh, in real time. So how was the how were the distances changing? So that app was also showing that. One thing I forgot to show you that that app also shows uh, many of the real satellites that are in motion about uh, the Earth or any other sort of orbit. So for example, if I just take the names of uh, Starlink, right? So uh, Starlink satellites were also visible in that app. Similarly, other ones, for example, which are either for the purpose of uh, just finding information such as uh, some telescopes, so those are also available in that app and you can also look at other sorts of satellites which are used for imaging or some sort of military purposes and so on. So anyways, our, uh, these were the burning questions that we imposed in the last uh, session and now we'll be looking at answering some of these. So first obviously no study of this chapter would be complete without mentioning our good old friend, the sun, right? So see this? So this is actually one of the solar flares uh, that the sun actually emits. And I know that you just saw this height, but on the scale of this, this looks pretty small, but this is like almost the size of the diameter of the earth, right? So this is how large the solar flare is. So let's quickly run through some of the concepts that we were discussing last time. So for example, we talked about the fact that stars and planets, the difference is stars are luminous bodies. Right, and what I mean by this is that these produce their own light. Right, so this means that they produce their own light. So, for example, one of the best known examples of the stars that we have at our hands is obviously the sun. So, they produce their own light. And based on the uh, information that we studied prior to this unit, we also know exactly how the sun produces energy. Obviously the importance of the sun to life on earth cannot be overestimated. If there wasn't the sun, obviously we could not see anything on earth, right? So we need some source of light to see that's how vision works. And also the temperature on earth would be very cold, not suitable for human survival. So we know that the sun produces some sort of energy and actually this is not just a one-time source of energy. This is a continuous source of energy, at least for the near future, right? So we know that this source of energy needs to be fueled by something. And in the case of the sun, we know that nuclear fusion between hydrogen is what fuels the, uh, the sun. Right, so that's what causes it to consistently produce energy. So for example, if uh, I know you guys have been listening less to me and focusing more on this animation, so you can focus on this sort of a dusty sort of hues that you can see here. So these are actually the plasma gases, right? So this is a plasma of the hydrogen gases and this is what is occurring in the uh, core of the sun, right? So at very high temperatures, 
this hydrogen is fusing together and this is actually what is powering the sun. So now if we continue with the concepts that we are talking about. So something else we were talking about last time was galaxies. Right? So what are galaxies? Galaxies are just collections of stars, planets and many more celestial bodies. Right, so in these many more celestial bodies you have uh, so you have meteors, you have comets, right? You have just clouds of gases floating around and they actually form a gravitational field of their own. So that's all you have and th uh, this is what galaxies are. So this is pretty basic common knowledge that we are inside the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is the name of the galaxy in which we are in. And we know, and uh, this is also a suitable time to introduce something, not officially part of the syllabus, but it can be asked, for example, for one marks, uh, because this is usually the content of most of the books. So the way that we describe the size of galaxies and of uh, very large celestial objects is we describe them in a unit called light years, right? So if I were to tell the diameter of this, so the diameter of this galaxy in which we are, is a hundred thousand light years right so what exactly is a light year so let me just talk about this so a light year as uh, the name says it's quite self-explanatory so this is the so one light year right so this is the distance traveled by light If it, if it traveled for a year right so a common misunderstanding for young eager minds of physics is that we usually on earth we as uh, we associate year uh, as a unit of time but when we are talking about interstellar distances we use the word light year so that seems kind of confusing as to how can time be used to measure distances so one light year is basically the distance traveled by light if it just traveled for one year so fairly simple so for example if I wanted to I can also figure out how much is this distance right what uh, one light year is equal to so this is simply the product of the speed of light and the time corresponding to one year so the speed of light is 3 into 10 to the 8 one year has 365 days each of those days has 24 hours and each of those days has 3600 seconds so we can actually come up with, uh, with a sort of conversion that one light year correct to 2 SF is 9.5 into 10 to the 10 meters again just a bit of a, a refresher as to why 2 SF because the least number of SF is the speed of light which is taken here to be 2 SF so let me just quickly pull up a picture of the Milky Way for you so here it is oh sorry not this one so this is the Milky Way so if I were to roughly locate where humans are on uh, so where we are where our solar system the Sun the earth all of these distances obviously uh, seem pale in front of this large distance of a hundred thousand light years so you can just imagine how large this distance would be. So we are approximately here at this location in the Milky Way, right? So we aren't uh, really in the center, we are kind of to one side. Now back to the example of stars and the concept we were talking about is that stars are luminous bodies, right? So the way in which they produce energy is by some sort of a nuclear reaction which is slightly different for the type of stars we have but again that is slightly out of the scope of the syllabus so let's not indulge in that debate so stars produce their own light and this might be a sort of a fun fact uh, for you guys which is that stars don't just produce light right so we know and coll collectively we say that stars produce energy right 
or another appropriate term would be to say that stars produce radiation so for example if we take the sun then the sun actually emits three types of radiation three of the majority type of radiations so it emits a lot of infrared this is actually more than 50 percent of the radiation of the sun it emits light which is like almost 35 to 40 percent of its total radiation and then it also emits some ultraviolet right and this is really small this is almost seven percent and we'll be continuing this uh, discussion in the lectures to come which is that uh, the radiation emitted is not just uh, one of those this is like this entire spectrum which is emitted right so whenever we are talking about a star right or the power of a star so we know that for example if we talk about the sun the sun is really bright right so the sun emits a lot of power this is why we are told not to directly look at the sun right so we know that the sun is very bright so there must be a sort of a measure in which we can express the brightness or the power of the stars so the sun is very bright Right, so, this, so this is something we know for a fact. So technically speaking, now is the time to introduce a term called luminosity. Right, and don't be deceived by the word luminosity. It's not just talking about light. Instead, the way luminosity is defined is this. So this is the total power of radiation. So by saying radiation, we actually uh, don't just talk about light we instead talk about all of these forms of electromagnetic radiation so this is the total power of radiation emitted by a star right so if we just talk about this quantity so the symbol of this is L right so L for luminosity obviously this is power so it would be scalar and the units are watts right so this is how we characterize uh, what or how powerful a star basically is so for example the luminosity of the Sun is this is 3.9 into 10 to the 26 watts right so this is the total power of radiation of the sun how we got this figure that will be a debate for another lecture but anyway let's just try to take this value as it is for once and if we think about what so what we know is the unit of powers so we can say that each second 3.9 into 10 to the 26 joules are released right so this is the energy generated by the sun in one second and earlier we were also talking about how this energy is actually generated so we know that this is due to nuclear fusion so now I have a question for you guys to do let's see if you can do this so this is the question the Sun's output power of 3.90 into 10 to the 26 joules per second is the result of mass energy transfer within the sun calculate the rate at which sun is transforming matter into electromagnetic wave energy so we can simply use the mass effect equation right so if we need to find the rate at which the sun is transforming matter so we basically need to find delta m right what is the rate at which mass is being transformed so this is delta e upon c square so delta E is 3.9 into 10 to the 26. C is the speed of light. So 3.0 into 10 to the 8 squared. So this turns out to be 4.3 into 10 to the 9. And the units will be kilograms per second. Right? Because this was the energy released in one second. So this is the mass transformed in one second. Right? So this is also a question that was asked in a very recent past paper related to this topic so the next idea we are going to talk about is this so we know that one of the 
actually the only major star we know uh, that is also visible that actually has some impact on life on earth is the sun right so the next closest star to us is actually a star called Proxima Centauri and as compared to how close the sun is to us so this is 250,000 times the distance uh, so the distance of earth from this star is 250,000 times the distance of earth from the sun right so this is how close uh, the next closest star after the sun so next closest star after sun is to us So the luminosity of this star, so this star has kind of an erratic sort of a behavior as compared to the sun because this has some periods in which it flashes very, very brightly, right? So its luminosity is actually much, much, much more than the luminosity of the sun. And there's actually a picture of this captured by the Hubble telescope. And this looks exactly like how you thought it would. So this is the highest definition picture of Proxima Centauri you could get. So it's pretty much like how we always imagine stars as kids, except for the shape, right? So this is how stars appear in movies as well, right? So this uh, intense flash. So the luminosity of uh, Proxima Centauri is, uh, so it's really much, much greater than the luminosity of the sun. But any star except the sun only appears to us as a small speck. Right, so it's not very visible. And what is the reason for that? So what I just told you was that this is very bright, right? So this is an image captured from the Hubble telescope, but this is also very, very far from us. So the luminosity, right? Not just the luminosity, the brightness that we see. So let's introduce another term. This is called apparent brightness. This does not uh, this does not just depend on the luminosity. This also depends on the distance that the star or any luminous body is away from us. So the basic idea is this that light just uh, light does not just travel in a straight line, right? So light travels out and spreads in space. And this uh, isn't really diffraction because a lot of the students think that this is diffraction no this is just how our space-time fabric is so what happens is that light doesn't just travel in one linear straight direction what happens is that it spreads out in space over an increasing area right so the more area it gets it just kind of like expands to occupy that area so the basic idea is this so let's say that this is our luminous body which at its surface has the luminosity L. So when it emits this light, what will happen is that this, uh, and not just light, all types of radiation, this spreads out over an area. So if we talk about area one, so that is at a distance D from this uh, center of this source. So the luminosity at this point would actually be spread over this area, right? So if you recall what luminosity is, so luminosity is the power Right, so this power would be spread out over this area. So this is a sort of intensity, right? And actually this is called the radiant flux intensity. Right, which is just basically the power incident normally per unit area. So this and apparent brightness mean the same thing. Both of these are alternatively used but the more appropriate word as uh, with reference to your syllabus is radiant flux intensity. So this is just a short derivation from now because we know that the power can be written as L, right? So this is the total power of radiation, the luminosity L, and the area can be written as the area of a sphere. So if the radius is D, so the area of the sphere becomes four pi D square, Right, because 4 pi r, r square is the formula for the surface area of the sphere. So 4 pi r square becomes uh, this 
thing and d is the radius so this becomes 4 pi d square so l upon 4 pi d square is radian flux intensity so basically at this same distance from the sphere of d1 the apparent brightness or the radiant flux intensity is the same all throughout then similarly at d2 this would be spread over a larger area right so this entire circle where the distance from the center is d2 the same radiant flux intensity would be experienced so if we were to just define this so the radiant flux intensity is the power incident per unit area right so this is intensity of a sort so we know the basic formula for intensity is power upon area when radiation is normally incident to this area right so this thing is important normally incident right so what we simply do is we take the luminosity divided by the distance from this luminous source and we use this formula so this d is the distance from this luminous source and then we just use this formula to find out the radiant flux intensity now let's have a look at another question which is related to both of these concepts as a whole so the luminosity of the sun is given the earth orbits the sun at a mean distance of 1.5 into 10 to the 8 kilometers calculate the radiant flux intensity of the sun near to the earth so if we just need to calculate this we would just need to use the formula above so i apologize i should have told you this so the symbol for radiant flux intensity is f right so f for flux so f is the symbol so f equals l upon 4 pi d square is what we would have to use so l is 3.9 into 10 to the 26 4 pi remains as it is this is a constant and this is 10 to the 8 uh, 10 to the 8 kilometers so kilo is 10 to the 11 uh, 10 to the 3 so 8 plus 3 this becomes 10 to the 11 and we also have a square on top of this so if you just solve this and give your answer correct to 2sf so this is 1350 but to 2sf this becomes 1400 watts per meter square So that sums up this lecture in which we talked about luminosity as well as radiant flux intensity. In the lectures to come, we'll actually talk about how do we know the luminosity of certain stars and how do the luminosities actually help in finding the radius of the stars. So that was actually one of the questions we posed right at the start of this unit. So if you want to find out the answer to that question, just stay tuned and you'll get the answer soon in the next couple of videos. See you there.